Hello listeners and thank you for joining us today. We have a very special episode lined up for you as I am being joined by David and Amelia, two ex-Pentecostal church members. Although they are each from different denominations of Pentecostalism, they both have incredible experiences to share with us today. My name is Casey and this is The Cult Vault. Pentecostal is an umbrella term that covers many varying factions of this religion. It started during the time of the Azusa Street Revival, which was a historic meeting that took place in 1906 and was led by African-American William Seymour in Los Angeles, California. A new doctrine came to light, but it would be rejected by many mainline Christians and ministers for many years. Despite the new doctrine being rejected, factions would continue to grow, followers would form their own denominations, and one of these earliest denominations was the Assemblies of God, formed around 1914 by Joseph Shep. Sources reveal that Shep described having a divine revelation from God as he meditated, saying that God revealed to him that baptism must be done in the name of Jesus only, not in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, otherwise known as Trinitarianism, also otherwise known as Orthodox Christianity. Shep went on to pen this new doctrine, calling it Jesus' name only. In October 1916, at the 4th General Council meeting in California, the Assemblies of God rejected this oneness teaching, calling it unbiblical doctrine, and alongside this they affirmed their own biblical doctrine of the Trinity. The Assemblies of God went on to ban around 100 pastors from their church on this day, pastors who had taken up the oneness doctrine against the Trinity. Later on in 1916, those pastors met in Arkansas and started their own movement. They named it Assembly of the Apostolic Assemblies. This began the oneness movement. In 1945, two smaller oneness groups merged, forming the United Pentecostal Church, or UPC for short. The United Pentecostal Church International, or UPCI, claims on their website to be the fastest growing denomination of Pentecostalism and claims of having up to 5.1 million constituents worldwide. The UPCI follows reimagined scripture that is different to Christianity and not just because they reject the Trinity. Pentecostals have three things that they believe in in order to be truly saved. One of them is baptism. Baptism is essential. Not only is baptism essential, but a very specific formula and a very specific set of words must be used during baptism in order to be saved. Alongside this, Pentecostals believe in speaking in tongues, which sounds a lot like speaking an unknown language or gibberish. This is God speaking through you when the Holy Spirit enters the body. The third thing which is important to note is the belief in faith healing. The belief that your faith can heal your ailments. This is where the big misconception of snake handling comes from. It is, in fact, only small fringe denominations of Pentecostalism that use snake handling to prove their faith can protect them, but it's often mistaken to be a core part of all Pentecostal movements. With me today, I have Amelia and David, who have very kindly agreed to come and share their stories with us. Amelia was formerly a member of the UPCI, and David was formerly a member of the Assemblies of God. So with me today, I have Amelia and David, who have very kindly agreed to come and share their stories with us. So hello, Amelia and David, and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Amelia, would you like to introduce yourself and give us a little bit of information on your background and sort of what you're up to today? So I'm Amelia. I just recently left like two months ago um, during the whole lockdown thing. So a lot of people don't know yet. Um, I've been in the church since I was born. Um, my family was raised in it. I'm a fourth generation, I think. And now I'm just trying to figure out how to get by without uh, angering anybody in the house or causing any like, uprising in the church that I was at. When you say that you haven't spoken to anybody yet, you're in your parents' house now. Do they, do they know about the decisions that you've made? Yeah, they were not happy. At first, they're still not happy. I think we've kind of reached a consensus about it, though, so they're not, like, hostile about it anymore. But they're still, they still don't really agree with my leaving. The conversation that we had would always go back and forth from, you're going in the wrong direction, and what if God punishes you for this, to, like, what is the church going to think? You know, like, they all respected you, they all loved you, and now you're just leaving, stuff like that. Yeah. 
uh, David, so hi to you as well. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and, and give us a little bit of information? Of course, yeah. So I uh, was not raised in the church particularly, but I kind of came to it on my own when I was about 17. So um, met some people there and kind of got more rooted into it. And then after I finished high school, I enrolled in seminary and I kind of came like became ordained through that tradition and I was involved with like um, their high school ministry and like young adults, things like that. So I was actually like preaching and leading for about um, about two years. And then I think I had been at the church for about five years when I left, which was just last year. Okay. Is there a particular reason why you decided to, to leave the church? Um, it wasn't super actually at choice at first. I had told my father and brother privately that I was gay and to come out to them and had asked them to keep it between the three of us um, until I could finish my school and get my degree. But then I got a phone call from a pastor the next morning and found out my brother had outed me to the church. So at that point, um, I was asked to leave. That's such an invasion of your privacy. Definitely. <laughs> Amelia, you're shaking your head. Is this like a common theme within both of your churches? So the reason I left was because my parents, even though I was, I was living on campus, so I was out of the house, um, they would track my phone and they would read my text messages and like they would tell pastor everything. And um, that just led to a lot of like, like conversations with pastor or like the very last service I ever went to was him trying to cast a demon out of me. So, oh my goodness! Yeah, so, um, <laughs> I I've seen unfortunately that like my situation was more mild compared to what I saw happen to a lot of other people in similar circumstances. So I actually had a pretty tame exit um, in comparison to those. So Amelia, when you talk about somebody trying to cast a demon out of you, what does that actually look like from within within your church? Usually bring the entire church around. They say it's to like, they, they all pray for you, but I think it's mainly just so everybody knows your business. For me, he was just like talking about how I had like evil thoughts and stuff. And then it was just, he would put his hands on my head and he would like shake me and start screaming and stuff. Because I, I've read a, I've read a lot about the, um, the speaking in tongues um part of of pentecostalism but i read a lot about falling into the spirit <laughs> um is that is that what that looks like where you, where you that you fall over because the the spirit of god has entered your body yeah and a lot of times for me it was just more like a peer pressure thing like everybody else was doing it and if you didn't do it then like you must have had something wrong with you you know oh absolutely because if you don't kind of participate you get singled out for being the only one who's not passed out on the floor and people notice that kind of stuff <laughs> so there's some pressure for sure so it yeah. seems like there's there's a there's a ton of peer pressure there's also a lot of promoting spying on each other these are all common themes of cult management and and management of control and and ways to control people's behavior and it's interesting that you've experienced these even though you're both from different denominations of the church from what i've read a lot of people get snake handling confused um as a, a main part of pentecostal practice but actually that's yes. only some <laughs> so that's only some some fringe definitely, denominations definitely. I actually had been in the church for almost four years and never even heard of it, which is how <laughs> uncommon it was. I heard of it from someone that was um, outside of the church, actually. They had kind of brought it up as a joke, like, oh, something about, like, bring out the rattlesnakes. I was like, um, I don't I don't have any snakes. So what are you talking about? And then, like, the whole thing came out that people people do that. I think it happens. Um, and I've heard stories of it happening. I don't think it's that common, though. I also, like, the only time I've ever even heard of it was when, like, other people would talk to me about it. And I'd be like, I've never been anywhere near a snake. I don't care to be near snakes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've both talked a lot about the, the pastor of your church and how much of an influence the pastor had on, um, on your congregations. There are things in the Bible that are, like, you have to follow the man of God and stuff, which it does say that to make every life decision under the will of your pastor. Like I had to ask about college. I had to ask about friends. I had to ask about like dating and 
most of the time, <clears throat> the only guys that he would let me date ended up being terrible, like very abusive, very dominant, because you're also supposed to be under the will of your husband eventually. If someone in the church finds out that you're doing something sketchy, they have to tell the pastor or they don't have to, but they're they encouraged. are encouraged. Yeah. <laughs> Because there's always this saying that's like, if you're doing something wrong, pastor will always find out. And it's like, yeah, because people are just going to rat you out about it. Any aspect of your life, you have to bring it to pastor. Like if I, when I quit my job to go to school, I had to make sure it was okay with him because I couldn't pay tithes anymore. Stuff like that. And is this a, a common theme for the, the sort of adults in the church and people that are older than the pastor? Um, yeah, like even elders, if they were going to buy a new house or if they were going to retire, um, they still have to bring that stuff to pastor and ask basically so, for his permission. So mostly any any big financial decisions go through the pastor. I don't know that I experienced like the, uh, the title tailing quite as much. Um, I def- it definitely happened for sure. I, don't, I never was in a situation where it was openly encouraged. So I don't think I ever felt that pressure to like tell on people, so to speak, quite as much. But I think more so in like the older people of the church, that was definitely present because the attitude was more so like, oh, if someone's doing something wrong and you know about it, but you don't help them, then like it's your fault if they like end up sinning or if they end up, you know, being deceived by Satan and like you led them astray. And like, so I think people, because of that kind of felt like guilty for things they didn't do. So I think that was very much used as a way to kind of influence people to um, kind of keep to themselves and kind of only talk about very select things that wouldn't get a lot of attention. As far as the um, decision making, that was certainly present. You had to get the pastor's permission for most things. It was like, where you go to school, if you would quit a job, you would get a different job. If you would date someone, if you would, um, you know, propose to somebody that you were dating, those all had to be run by um, the leadership of the church beforehand. Okay. And if these decisions that, that, that are run past the pastor seem to be mostly ones uh, around finances, um, how, how was, was it expected that, that, that a portion of what, what money you earned was, was given to the church? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Any, anyone who works at all, if you were, you know, 16 with your first job ever, or if you just like, even if you were like, got like an allowance from your parents, you were, you know, underage, you were expected to give 10% of any kind of income to the church. Yeah. And what would happen if you just decided that that, that, that wasn't something you were going to do? Or did that ever happen? For me, um, especially when I didn't have a job, and like I was just making like barely any money doing like random babysitting. Um, <clears throat> my pastor would be like, even if you only make one dollar, you have to give like ten cents of that. And when I did, when I didn't, he'd be like, "Well, we can't use you in the church. Like, you can't be a singer. You can't like be a Sunday school teacher. You can't be involved at all unless you pay your tithes." And were those things that you wanted to be involved in? <clears throat> yes. Well, another problem with it was, like, if you were already involved in that stuff and then pastor made you step down, it would cause a lot of, like, gossip in the church, like, you must have done something wrong. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. I mean, they always say it's for your own good and not to embarrass you, but, like, I don't think they would hold it over your head so much if it wasn't supposed to be used as a, a scare tactic almost. Judgmental... Pentecostal people are pretty mean sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> that is Absolutely. the that is the 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 overarching theme of all of the research that I've done is the <laughs> is the like um, holier than thou. Um, Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I I've got um, actually a, a, another quote from uh, April here who who messaged me um, just just given me her her experiences on uh, being a part of the um, assemblies of God and she said um, that. I definitely thought I was better than people because I was saved. I knew the correct truth and was following the creator of the universe. I didn't smoke. I didn't cuss. I didn't date. I was pure. I was good. And I was better. Sounds accurate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely not proud of it, but like growing up in the environment where they tell you these things, like I didn't have friends in high school unless I was in my mind thinking like, I'm obviously better than them and I need to convert them or they're going to hell you know yeah. 
like I said, I'm not proud of it, but when you're, when you grow up in that area where that's all they tell you, there's really nothing else. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, no, I I came into it. I was a little bit older, but, um, she said as well, you know, it's, you're not really encouraged to have friendships with people outside of the church. And if you are, it's, there's always an end game. There's always an agenda of, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to save their soul and I'm going to get them to come here too. And it's never just um, for the sake of like just a pure friendship or anything else. There's always ulterior motive. That's sort of the, the us versus them doctrine sort of, um, you know, if if you, if you don't come over to to this side, then you'll, then you'll burn in hell. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. Cause I, I know that Amelia, you spoke a lot about how, um, you know, that's, that, that's terrified you for a very long time. Um, the thought that, you know, if you leave the church, these things will happen to you. Yeah. And even like when I was in church, like even when I was like super devout in the religion, like I never felt like I was good enough to get into heaven. Like I have, nightmares and I have panic attacks when there are storms because I'm always worried that God's coming back and I'm just gonna like yeah. die me too and so, <laughs> yeah April said to me this morning she said I don't worry about the devil anymore except when I watched hereditary last year and I'd gotten home at midnight and the air pressure of me closing the door to my apartment made my attic door swing open I screamed so I played worship music all night just in case yeah it's either play Christian music all night or just like rock back and forth in your bed like god I'm sorry I don't know what I did (laughs) absolutely Uh, April said to me this morning that um what's interesting about my childhood dynamic is that my dad is agnostic he doesn't go around saying that to people he just believes in nothing I remember trying to witness to him in first grade and he was like well you know there are people in other parts of the world who believe in the moon for example and they worship the moon how do you know that they're wrong and that you're right? I was so disheartened by his response. I remember going to my room and crying and feeling like I had could never get through to him and get him to see that I had the truth. Of course, those people who worship the moon are wrong. We all know that that's ridiculous. H- how do you think it would feel to have a family member or do you know how it feels to have a family member who's not, who's not following your religion and being worried for their well-being? My mom's side of the family has kind of left the church. And I remember, like, growing up thinking, like, well, they'll be sorry eventually because they talk bad about their religion, which I know is wrong now. But, like, growing up, I was like, well, they're just not going to get into heaven then. I wasn't ever, like, sad about it. I was more, like, kind of cocky about it. Just like, well, if they're just going to act that way, then whatever, you know? I'd say so. Which I, don't, I don't know if I felt that as much on a personal level because I was really the only one in my family that... um was a part of that group specifically so that was kind of just what I had always known but when I saw that happen more so in real time with kind of my friends and their parents people that would choose to kind of break away I felt it kind of on their behalf but very similar to what Amelia said it wasn't even really like a sadness which you would think maybe you were supposed to feel but it was more so like well (laughs) that's what you get like (laughs) yeah just um just going back to um one of the points we spoke about before in your notes that you sent over david you said that a heterosexual marriage was the the be all and end all of any relationship from within the church absolutely and that was expected to be a a union between a man and a woman who are both practicing some type of pentecostal worship absolutely it had to be either to assembly of god or to upci that they could that's true there anything um as far as even similar groups that weren't your group specifically, it was discouraged as well. So if you were... Okay, yeah, was, was it... Was, so relationships outside of your denomination were discouraged. What about what about the doctrine of other denominations? Was that also seen as... Was that, was that seen as heresy or...? Definitely. I know that like with the Assemblies of God specifically, it's like we're the only ones that are correct. Our theology mm-hmm. is the only correct one. Even any kind of other form of Christianity at all, you know, Catholics, Baptists, um, other Protestants, anything else, they were all is huge by the devil and we were the only ones that knew the truth i think for us it was more of a competition like oh well we believe in oneness and like oh well we wear long skirts or oh well we speak in tongues <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was yeah it was like one was always better than the other so so you're a non-married couple and you're within the upci for example and but you're still not allowed to live together oh no definitely not no not until you're married you can't even mm be in the same room like alone together there was um 
a friend of mine who had been with her fiance for going on 10 years, but they had a wedding date set, but had not had the wedding yet. And they moved in together, signed a lease. And then the church said either, you know, you have to get married right now or you have to leave the church. And, you know, mm-hmm. they, they couldn't really have a wedding at the moment for financial reasons they had you know, plans and things. So they, they left. That must be difficult at the moment for people that aren't isolating together, that aren't married. Mm-hmm. They've been seen, haven't probably haven't been able to see each other for, you know, coming up to three months now. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to say, um, on a side note quickly, do you think that um, people who have had to take these three months away from the church have had time to step back and maybe reflect on some things that, that are maybe not, not working for them in the same way that you two have managed to? Yeah, I've noticed that the ex-Pentecostal group on Reddit has grown a lot since since the quarantine. And I think it's just because like people are starting to like settle down and be like, well, we're not, we haven't been to church in a couple months and I still don't feel like, you know, like worshiping the devil or something like that. So it's not a big deal. I guess if you're like April, who is going to all the dance clubs and music groups and then go into all your mum's dance clubs and music groups that that are all within the church you don't really get a chance to step away from that environment but if you're in lockdown for three months and you're not actually living with the group that you practice your worship with that would give you a really good opportunity to have some like cognitive dissonance from the group and say well hang on a minute you know why why should I ask permission on on which university I'd like to go to right of course Mm -hmm. If if you're kind of when when they when they talk about the heterosexual relationships, um, was there ever a point where you were sitting there thinking, you know, worrying about the time where you would have to speak to them, um, about your uh, sexuality definitely. or? Absolutely, that was something that I was kind of always terrified of, you know. Um, and there were points where I was you know, like dating women just for the sake of you know not having to have that conversation. Um, are they were they women so within was... the church? They were, yeah. So that was, you know, people that they would know and, you know, approve of and whatever. So that I knew that any time, you know, that happened, I wouldn't enjoy it, but I knew that it would kind of postpone the inevitable as far as, you know, me revealing things that they wouldn't care to hear. Coming out for a person, I think, is a significant moment in their life. And do you feel like that was taken away from you? Um, yes and no. Maybe not as a whole, because there was, I still had the chance to kind of tell people on an individual level, you know, kind of the way I wanted to, but it definitely, um, I think put me in a situation where I had to do that sooner than I would have liked to. I know, again, anything, you know, premarital is not allowed. Like, um, I don't, our situation wasn't quite as strict as Amelia's was, I believe. Like, you could still go on dates and be alone, um, together, but, um, like, there was no, um affection like publicly like there was no holding hands kissing hugging um certainly nothing sexual was supposed to happen if you weren't married um that was that was a really big thing like i know like there were situations where like parents would find out like their teenage children had like been you know inappropriate and they would be like brought on stage on a sunday morning to you know air their dirty laundry and they would either like have to you know repent publicly on a microphone they like maybe couldn't come back you know it was really um i think the sexual aspect in particular was very like focused on and singled out, you know, especially for younger people. Um, yeah, no drinking, absolutely not. No drinking, no smoking. Um, any kind of like um, non-Christian music was not allowed. Um, so you either had to listen to like hymns or uh, like some type of contemporary Christian music, but nothing like no top 40 radio and no, no rock music. You couldn't listen to like, like the Beatles or anything, you know, even that's kind of like tame you know by modern standards that was not allowed at all and what was the reasoning behind that um just that you would be influenced to like um have an incorrect idea you know of the world and of god that you would just be influenced by any you know, of the secular music that was kind of you know, everything was pitted is out to get you so if it wasn't directly from the church then it had some type of goal you know to lead you astray and take you off the right path there were even like um christian singers that if they were thought of as like not Christian enough you know you couldn't listen to them either even if it was Christian music who would you ask if if a band was appropriate or not um we had like a music pastor that you could kind of run that stuff by but ultimately as with everything else like the the pastor of the church kind of had the final say on all that stuff as well we were like strictly discouraged from listening to anything remotely not Christian like even if it was musicals or anything yeah and the reasoning behind it was like Satan was an angel of music and so that's That's how he gets people (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) 
The three things that make Pentecostalism different from Christianity is the, the speaking in tongues, the, the <laughs> difference in baptism, but there's also um, a list of standards I've found that people are supposed to follow, like holiness standards. It's not so much for men as it is for women, and I think that's mainly just a submission thing. Women can't cut their hair. I've been made fun of many times because my hair doesn't grow very long. They always accuse me of cutting it. They can't wear makeup, like not even concealer, um, at least not in my church. Other churches were like whatever, but mine pretty strict on it. Can't paint your nails, not even clear. Sleeves always have to be like right there or longer. Your skirt had to be past your knees. Um, can't wear any jewelry unless it's a wedding ring and even your wedding ring it can't have a very big diamond at least that's how it was for my church it's not the same everywhere else though what would happen if you were to come to the church and and you've accidentally forgotten to take your earrings out or or something oh no you weren't allowed to wear them in public like at all you couldn't get your ears pierced you couldn't wear them in public at all and if somebody was to see you out wearing your earrings that would go straight back to the pastor he would go to the pastor, yes. And then he would he pull you to one side and speak to you about it? Or would it be like David's church where everybody's just sort of publicly shamed? For me, which I never did anything big, like my problem, apparently, I had friends that were outside of the church. And so what happened was he pulled me aside privately and talked to me about it. And I thought that was it. I told him I was sorry. I told him I'd be better. And then a couple weeks later, he kind of went up in front of the whole congregation and cast a demon out of me. David, is, is this is this something that you've seen before? Um, actually, no. Um, in our church, women could wear makeup, cut their hair. A lot of people like had tattoos. Even that wasn't really something that they were concerned about. I think more of the control and morality was more so like around like relationships and intimacy, really more than anything else. The biggest thing that I can really I guess equate with Amelia's experience is just that alcohol was absolutely like a no no. I mean, we all drink anyway, but <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't know about that. Have either of you managed to speak in tongues? Um, I think I thought I was at the time, mm-hmm. but you know, like hindsight's twenty twenty, I guess. But now it's kind of like, oh, like those are some cool noises. I guess. <laughs> talk um, me, talk yeah. me through, talk me through how that how that happens, and what it's what it's all about, and and the experience, and and how you end up in that situation where you think that that it's happening. Well, I remember the first time I did. I was like seven, and I remember being like is this really what they've all been talking about? Because it doesn't really seem that great. But um, I think they kind of teach you to do it because, like I said, you, I was kind of raised in it, so I saw how it worked. They'll do this thing where they'll kind of like hit your chin like that sometimes, and it'll kind of like train your jaw to like move up and down, I guess. So like wobble? Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, and I think a lot of it has to do with emotions. Like, you know, when you're crying a lot, you kind of just like, you start saying things like gibberish and stuff. Because, I mean, not all the time, but usually when you're really emotional, people can't really understand what you're saying. I think that was kind of what it was in the Bible. And I think I'm leaning more towards agnostics. So I don't really know if this is correct. But um, the whole speaking in tongues thing in the Bible is nothing like what Pentecostals try to teach you nowadays. Because in the Bible, it's supposed to be like when you speak it, either there's an interpreter that can tell everybody what you're saying or like you're speaking and anybody from any language can understand what you're saying. That's supposed to be what it is. It's not just saying random syllables until people understand like he's got the spirit. That's not what it's supposed to be. Where does the whole speaking in tongues come from? It comes from a a particular part of the Bible. It does. Yeah. You know, and just like having been, you know, a theology student for a while, like Emily hit that pretty well like it's in scripture it exists especially like in the book of acts in the new testament but it's very much supposed to be like you know um the apostle paul talks about like oh you have your own spiritual language it's just between you and god it's not meant to be understood and that's Mm -hmm. that's more so like you know you're alone praying in a room with door closed so that way like it doesn't matter you know if people can understand you or not but then when in uh, I believe it's Second Corinthians, he says like you know there's supposed to be someone that can understand you. This is God's gift. Get a message to somebody that maybe you wouldn't know it in the language that you speak. So that wasn't supposed to be like this gibberish kind of speaking. It was supposed to be an actual human language that you just wouldn't have known otherwise. So mm-hmm. outside of those two contexts, there's not really any kind of backing for what they talk about. You know, so that's why like you go to a, a Sunday night service and then there's people kind of like slobbering and 
you know, smacking you on the forehead and telling you you have the spirit. It's not really <laughs> what, yes. what the Bible was talking about. Is it an overwhelming experience? It is, it is a lot of like emotion driven stuff. Like they encourage you to like cry. And honestly, most of the time, if you don't cry while you're speaking in tongues, they'll just assume that you're not actually doing it right. Um, I think for when you first do it, it's because for me, I have a lot of anxiety and there were like a million people around me. And so I started crying and then they were like, you're getting it, you're getting it. And so I was like, okay, well, I guess this is what it's supposed to feel like. And so most of the time you just cry and then just say a few words and that's it. Did you ever uh, look over the room and see somebody else sort of struggling in the same way that you were and feeling uncomfortable? Um, Yeah, I brought this girl, (laughs) I brought this Catholic girl to a youth rally, which you don't know what that is, but for Pentecostals, it's like a church on steroids because it's just a bunch of young people jumping around and stuff. Yeah. (laughs) And yeah, and you know, most Catholic churches, they're just kind of, they're very stoic, they're very like reverent and they just kind of sit in silence and like pray this was the first pentecostal service she'd ever been to and so she had a huge meltdown during it where people thought she was getting the spirit and i had to apologize to her many times afterwards (laughs) she was not happy (laughs) david you're nodding away there i I, i'm guessing this is something that you've experienced as well absolutely you know just being involved kind of with like um youth ministry young adults for as long as i was um you know I, i had been to many a youth camp so there was always like the one friend that wasn't Pentecostal that somebody brought with them, you know, to summer camp and they just look like everyone's insane and they're like, don't want to be there. <laughs> yeah. Well, so these, these youth camps, were they, was it encouraged that you brought somebody along with you that wasn't already in the oh, church? Yes. They would give you money if you brought people that were yeah. from outside, uh, outside the tradition, for sure. So, so this is how you would bring more people into the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was hugely like incentive driven, like, Sometimes you get money. Sometimes you get like perks. Like my church mm-hmm. camp would be like, um, you got to ride around in the golf cart all week, or you got like first in line at the snow cone stand, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Were there any other methods of indoctrination that they were encouraging you to use? It varied. I think for us, somewhat by age groups, like we would use some of um, the similar ways Amelia mentioned that they were like younger, kind of like high school age, but for, cause like we had a separate one that was kind of more for college age students. So like when they would come, they'd be like, Oh, Hey, like, if you convince somebody to come, we'll, um, and you, just, you have to take off work to go. We'll pay you for like the hours you missed at work. If you come to this camp. So, um, you know, they, they made it a little more, I guess, relevant to, uh, people that were older. I kind of wish I had that experience for <laughs> us. It was right. like, <laughs> if you don't take off work, like you obviously don't care enough about God. Right. Then, <laughs> then you're greedy and you love money more than the Lord. And right. yeah, so we wouldn't get paid. We would, we would get paid in the spirit. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I wanted to to draw on that you um, had said, Amelia, was that um, the pastor would say to you after this service, you'll feel like what you believe in is wrong. Mm-hmm. That was that was said to you. That that was a common theme at the end of your services. A lot of the times, like especially if it was like a really like fired up service where people have been jumping around and stuff, the pastor would always make a point to get up and be like, after this service, like you might feel like what you've done is stupid or like the revelations that you have were just in the moment and emotional and they would be like that's just the devil trying to keep you from doing what you're actually supposed to be doing (laughs) (laughs) i don't know if that's a thing with david but that was a very big thing with ours no absolutely i think that you know um we reached out to you on reddit you mentioned that like controlling of thoughts things like that and that was definitely how they went about that you know they anytime that you had a doubt or you know thought that something just like, didn't make sense or you know you were questioning things that was always the devil you know the devil mm-hmm. was making you doubt things the devil was trying to take you away from the experiences that you had and kind of talk you out of believing in the truth things like that it's not like everyone was like either didn't voice the concerns they had because you know they didn't want people to think they were being deceived by satan or they just like wouldn't even you know say anything acknowledge it to themselves you know because they thought like oh i just i can't think that way you know it's evil to question anything public shamings in your church were a common thing absolutely yeah did you ever experience any of this personally i was offered (laughs) to experience it i guess um you know as i mentioned earlier like uh, i was kind of outed you know somewhat by my brother so um, at that point, I'd been there for five years. I was super involved. You know, I was in um, theology school. I was like 
leading the worship services. I was, you know, preaching to, you know, the high school students, things like that. So I, um, I guess had a lot to lose in that sense. So the pastor said, Hey, you know, like I'm willing to kind of look the other way and like, you know, forgive you basically, but you have to come up on stage on Sunday on a microphone and like apologize say like, Oh, you made it up and you weren't, you're not actually gay. Um, you didn't mean it. Like basically just kind of take back everything that I had said. So I guess I, I had the opportunity for a public shaming, but I did not uh, take him up on that. And that's when you stepped, stepped back from the church and decided to leave. Yes, absolutely. They do have a way of like trying to get you to tell on yourself. Like mm-hmm. when I had my conversation with pastor, it went like, well, you seem like you've been kind of in a fog lately. And in my head, I was like, well, I've been in a fog for quite a long time and you're just now <laughs> saying something. And right. I'd be like, well, I'm just starting college. And so it's kind of stressful and stuff. And he'd be like, are you sure you're not talking to people that you're not supposed to be talking to? And I'd be like, I don't think so. I think I'm doing fine. <laughs> and then he would just keep adding on to it until I would like say it myself. I'm like, if you already mm-hmm. know, then why don't you just yeah. save us all some time? Yeah. Say so if he says things 10 times, maybe you'll say it uh, and agree with him. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, now you've said it 10 times. Maybe actually you're right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so David, you decided to, to leave the church at that point. I, I don't did. understand how somebody can stand in front of you with a straight face and say to you, you know, just go up there I and know. tell them that you made it all up. How, how can well, well, crazily enough, like people, people have done it, um, you know, and I, I, I think maybe if I had like been in it longer from a younger age, maybe I would have, but I think, you know, I had, you know, connections and kind of a life outside of that. It wasn't a pleasant experience, but like I knew I'd come out of it okay, but I can see for sure how somebody, you know, who was raised in it or had been there their whole lives, you know, that they're like, oh, I'm going to, my family's not going to talk to me. I'm not going to have anything, you know, so I'll say anything I need to, to keep this yeah. going. Do you think there's, there's a lot of, of people trapped sort of w- within these, within these churches? Yeah, Definitely. you're basically not necessarily forced, but encouraged to the degree where you feel like you have to get married straight out of high school. Yeah. Um, it's like I have friends who are my age who are married and it's crazy because I feel like a child. But um, I think that's kind of like for them to keep you in it, like keep you more grounded in it. Because Definitely. when you're like tied to somebody like that you can't just think for yourself. Like even if you weren't Christian, you can't just think for yourself. You have to like have at least some kind of understanding with the person that you're with. And it's very hard to do that when they're also very indoctrinated. Um, Or like me, I had to move back in with my parents and go to different churches on my own. But at first was like a huge hassle because they would always be like, you can't do that under my roof or things like that you feel very codependent on the people that you're around and especially for me having grown up in it and don't have very many friends outside of the church um it's very hard to leave because you feel like your entire personality was just the church you know what happens with your relationship now with god How, how where do you stand um Like I said earlier, I think I'm leaning more towards agnostic because I'm a pre-med student and I've seen some pretty impossible things happen in that area where like cancer cells do just leave for no reason and stuff like that. But like at the same time, I don't, I don't think it's the same like Bible God because there are so many contradictions in there. And there are so many times where I've tried to be like, God, I need an answer. I just need something. And if you really cared, you would help me out. And I've just gotten nothing. And so I think for me that there's still something out there. It's just not the same thing that I've been taught my whole life. I'd have to agree more or less with Amelia. You know, I think that like there have been you know things in my life that I just can't really explain so I acknowledge that there's something I just don't know if I'm going to put you know like the Christian God space to that anymore what is the day of Pentecost (laughs) okay um he was in the seminary so he can probably tell the story a lot better than me but basically what I was taught was like after God ascended into heaven or Jesus people just like waited in this room for like eight days and prayed for like eight days And then after a while, God kind of fell upon them. And it's supposed to, it was described as like a rushing wind. And like, that's when people started speaking in tongues for the first time. That's actually where like Pentecostals get it mixed up because even the people who saw it happening were like, hey, they're speaking actual languages that they shouldn't be able to speak. Right, I can understand them, right. So that's pretty much what my take on it was. 
New Testament, you know, Jesus, you know, crucified, you know, resurrected, and then um, ascended to heaven. So I believe Pentecost is meant to be 50 days after his ascension. So he mm-hmm. basically, you know, told his um, disciples before they left, before he left, excuse me, and said, hey, like, go wait in this room and, you know, don't eat, don't sleep, don't anything. And then, like Amelia said, it was eight days, you know, after that. Are you practicing any kind of religion at all? Um, I've actually made a full 180 and I'm a witch <laughs> now. So, <laughs> yes, I would say so. Like Wiccan? Yes, this yes, ma'am. Okay, explain to me a little bit more about that because <laughs> that's really interesting. <laughs> um, I think it always kind of had like a little bit of an appeal to me, just kind of in a vague way of like, ooh, that's cool and mysterious. But, you know, I didn't, I didn't think a whole lot of it. Um, but I think, you know, after some time away from the church, when I had an opportunity to kind of look into things um, for myself, kind of look into other faiths without them being, you know, demonized, I just kind of uh, saw how really broad it was. And you can be, you know, a witch and believe in every god or no god at all. And it's more so about a lot of like um, internal emotional things and kind of just healing and being a good person. And I thought that was nice. So mm-hmm. this, is, this is where I ended up. I remember like, because I was trying to get to know both of y'all. And so I looked on y'all's profile and I looked on David's and I was like, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how uh, expected that was, but. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. I was just like, wow, that's a huge turn of it. <laughs> it was a It was a big change, yeah. <laughs> and do you do you have a, a group that you meet with to to practice? I do. Yeah, we unfortunately haven't been able to meet um, in person for a while due to um, you know everything being shut down right now. But we um, we do things like this, and we we would be meeting in person you know, if we could. And that's kind of suiting you a lot better. Do you feel more comfortable with the position that you're in now? I do. You know, it's it's a lot more um, personal experience, you know, like you know, just whatever resonates with you is what's true for you. No specific, you know, belief or doctrine or lack thereof even is really um, impressed on anybody. So it's really cool just in the sense of how you're encouraged to think for yourself and to research and to learn and to kind of they're fine with whatever you come to, you know, and that's not something obviously I think we would be used to <laughs> in the situations that we came out of. Mm-hmm. We love the independent thoughts. <laughs> yeah, Emilio, do, would you like to um to just talk <clears throat> us through kind of any any of any of the lasting effects? I've only been out for a couple of months, so I'm not sure how lasting effects really will affect me in the future. But I know, like I said, like storms freak me out. I live in mm-hmm. Tornado Alley, so I mean, anytime there's a tornado or anywhere near a tornado, I'm just like. God's coming back and I'm not ready and I'm just going to go to hell, I guess. There's also a lot of things like when I wore pants for the first time, I was like just freaked out the whole time. Like, this is not what I'm supposed to look like. Um, I had like one glass of wine in my entire life. And when I first drank it, I was like, I'm going to be sick because this is all the things that I've uh, been told that happen. I still have a lot of like worries about if I do this and I end up being wrong, God's just going to send me to hell. That's mainly my biggest fear is because they teach you from children like how terrible hell is and they use it as a scare tactic all the way up into adulthood. And so that's really my only worry is just that anything that I could possibly do anymore could send me there. I don't know that I've had uh, quite that experience, but again, that could also just be that I haven't, I wasn't as part of it, you know, as long as you were, Amelia. But um, yeah, I think there's definitely kind of just like a general anxiety, you know, of like, oh, what if I like get hit by a car and don't wake up today and I was wrong the whole time and just the kind of things like that, kind of just lingering doubts, I guess. I don't know <laughs> if I can attribute that really to anything specifically, but definitely just kind of like that random fear that comes up every now and then of like, oh, what if I was wrong and I shouldn't have left? Yeah. Does the does the does the relief and and the you know the independent thought and being able to, to kind of choose what you eat and drink and wear do all of those things um, outweigh the anxiety? For me, they certainly do. Yeah, I mm-hmm. think that's kind of almost like how I don't become overwhelmed by it. It's because I'm like, okay, well, you know, like you know, God is real, and that's true. And I think that we should have, you know, like He would want us to be critical thinkers, and He would want us to enjoy, you know, the life that we have while we're here. So that's kind of how I get through that. Yeah, like when I think about all the things that I could do, I, my first initial thought is like, you could go to hell for that. But then I'm like, yeah, but I actually have the choice to do it now, and. Mm-hmm. 
most people think that these things are okay, so I must be okay doing them. Right. So, so even though you're <clears throat> you're encouraged to not wear makeup and to wear skirts below the knee, and um, you know, and to me- men to keep their their faces shaved and their hair neat, um, <laughs> to to be as pure on the outside as you are on the inside, I believe that's that's right. why the the those 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 list of standards exist. Do you think that okay to wear jewellery and makeup? God's not going to look at you and say, I don't like the fact that you have that tattoo, so (laughs) I'm not going to allow you to be saved. That's one of the things that I've struggled with my whole life is those standards. Like I never question them outwardly because of how they handle that. But um, there are a lot of bad people in the world who like murder people and assault people and I just don't see how God would line those terrible people up with someone who just wore makeup and be like yeah you're all going Mm -hmm. to the same place right and people who have tried to tell me that I'm wrong are like the Bible says even the smallest sin is as bad as the biggest sin but at the same time if you're just putting something on your face you don't even look that different you're just maybe like covering up a pimple or something and God's just going to be like you wore makeup that one time yeah. so you got to go you and your pimple and it's too late now. <laughs> <laughs> even if you changing your appearance outwardly does not change mm-hmm. your you know how devoted you are to to to, to who you worship mm-hmm. and do either of you have any advice to anybody who may be in um a similar situation and starting to think maybe some things are wrong or starting to have mm-hmm. sort of a sense that 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 things aren't quite adding up for them i'd say if anybody because for me i've been thinking about leaving for a very long time and I was always like, well, the process of doing it's going to suck and I'm going to be faced with all these people who are trying to like come against me and stuff. For me, the f- like the second that I actually left, it was just like a huge weight off my shoulders. And yeah, I still deal with some people who know that I've left who are kind of condescending about it. But at the same time, like you never have to face those people ever again. So the act of actually doing it is not nearly as hard as you think it's going to be. I think I would just try and be as encouraging as I could and say like, like the life that you will have on the other side, once you have the freedom is totally worth all of the difficulty and discomfort from leaving. And just like, which I guess is easy, you know, just for us to say, you know, being on the other side of it. But like, you know, we've, we've had these lived experiences. And so when you come out of that, like it's difficult, you know, it's painful and it's a lot of pretty drastic change. But being able to live a life and it's authentic is, is very much worth that for sure. Mm-hmm. That's some really good advice. That's really, that's really nice for anybody who's kind of thinking, <laughs> oh, I'm not sure if I'm, what if I'm making the wrong decision or... Is there anywhere anybody can go to for any support or advice if they are thinking about leaving the church, but they um, maybe they don't have many connections or ties outside of the church? Um, for me, I had, and I know it's a privilege that I had this and not everybody can have it. But when I first dealt with my parents, basically like stalking me and stuff, and my pastor coming and telling me I was going to hell and whatever. I talked to my professors at my college and they got me free therapy for it, which like I said, not everybody can get. If you are able, you're 18, you can make your own medical decisions and stuff to get therapy. That's been the main helper with me, especially since I can't really talk to friends right now because everything's kind of shut down. Um, Just having someone that you can talk to about your thoughts and then being able to rationally explain to you why you're thinking that um, was definitely helpful. David, would, would you agree with that? Some type of therapy could help? I would definitely recommend it. Yeah. Um, I think especially like, you know, it wasn't just kind of like, oh, I tried this church and I didn't like it. And I, I decided I'd go somewhere else. You know, there's a lot of, you know, spiritual kind of trauma um, and abuse that took place. I think any time that you can get, you know, some educated professionals to kind of help you process through that. I think that's a good idea. If that's not an option that you have. I know that there's also the ex Pentecostal group on Reddit. Um, and, and I see a lot of people offering sort of support and guidance on there for people who maybe 
unfortunately more isolated than others. It always very intelligent people that I find inside of these groups. I speak to some people about my research and they say, how can people be indoctrinated into cults? How can they not tell that they're being manipulated? And I think it's a very common misconception that people inside of cults are weak minded and they don't have strong spirit and they don't have strong will. Do you agree that that, that that's a misconception? Yeah, for me, I didn't even realize it was a cult until I started looking into it myself. I was, it's just, like I've said, when you grow up with that kind of stuff, you really don't have any other way to think. It's not that you're weak-minded, it's just that that's the only thing you've been taught. I don't know how it is for David because he wasn't in it all his life, but that's how it was for me. Yeah, I think that they they present themselves as having all the answers. You know, to mm-hmm. life's problems. You know, my family situation, you know, growing up wasn't really that great. So to me, like they had, you know, solutions to problems I'd had, you know, like for as long as I could remember. That really, honestly, more like than the re- religious aspect is what appealed to me. I was like, oh, like these people, there's a community and they take care of each other and like, you know, they're responsible and they'd help you out with like finding a place to live and getting a job. And it was, you know, things that my, my parents hadn't really done. So I think that was kind of like my, my foot in the doorway. And then like, by the time I realized kind of like what was going on, it was like, oh, wow, this is, this is, um, they, they present themselves very differently than what they actually practice. And stuff. So the, 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 the love bombing aspect of the indoctrination where sort of, yeah. you know, people offer to do your cooking and your cleaning and, and all that stuff. Absolutely. Or yeah. They <laughs> offer like, oh, well, like, you know, we're all so nice and like, we're nice because God's changed our lives. Like come find out why we're so great. And like, you know, they, they really sell it. Yeah, but the second you leave the church, they're not going to do nothing for you anymore. They're just going to be like, you can do stuff yourself now. Have either of you two um, actually brought anybody into the church and you kind of feel like you need to reach out to them and go back on on anything and and get them to change their minds on on being a part of the church? Um, No, I actually, I was never able to convert anybody. And um, I felt like I was a failure for a long time because a big part of... Pentecostalism is just getting more people into the church. But now, honestly, I, I'm really glad that I didn't because, like, for one, I'd be a huge hypocrite for leaving. And also, I don't know how I would be able to face them and be like, I'm so sorry, I was wrong. Um, I don't know what kind of damage I would have caused to those people. David, did you did you bring anybody into your church? Um, not that I know of. I, I may have like, indirectly... <laughs> Um, over the years of just kind of like having, you know, the platform that I had, but I don't think I can recall like specific times where I've sat somebody down and like, oh, hey, like, come with me. You know, I don't think, I don't think I've had any of those situations. I w- wasn't very successful um, with mission work either. <laughs> so yeah, not, not that I can think of. Thank you so much for, for, for speaking to me today. I think your experiences will help other people um, who may be in similar situations realize that you know that there is a happiness on the other side that there, there is a life outside of the church and there are positive experiences and people who will listen to your story and not be judgmental you know and, and be there to hold your hand and help you through counseling if if you can get it obviously sounds like a really good road to go down it sounds like that's really helped you Amelia um, I'm really glad that your parents are willing to have some kind of dialogue about your situation because it would be awful to be in a house where that couldn't happen, uh, where you felt yeah. isolated and alienated. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you have that platform to be able to speak to them. And David, I'm glad that you are practicing being <laughs> a witch, which is great yes. because it sounds like you don't have to feel oppressed in your sexuality. We are where we are in the 21st century and it seems ridiculous that anybody should have to hide their sexuality in For this sure. day and age. Right? So I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm really happy that both of you seem to be in, in a much better place. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for, for joining me today, Amelia and David. I really appreciate your time. Awesome. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. I hope you both enjoyed the rest of your day and I can't wait to share this show with you. Bye. Bye. If you find yourself in a cult or know someone who might be, please follow the link in the description for more information on how to get advice and support. If you would like to send me an email, you can on cultvaultpodcast at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at cultvaultpod. Find me on Reddit at cult-vault. Find me on Facebook at The Cult Vault. Find me on YouTube, Tumblr, Instagram at cultvaultpodcast. I'm Casey and thank you so much for listening.